If you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 10. Mark, chapter 10. Again, Mark is select. Um, the volumes that could have been written about everything that Jesus did would fill libraries in just a, sh a short time. Even in his ministry time, over three years, it, it, it couldn't all be given. And by the wisdom of God, he didn't give us, you know, an entire library to consume uh, to know his truth. He condensed that down, didn't he, to uh, 66 books, 39 and 27. So three times nine is 27, right? So 39 in the old and 27 in the new. And uh, those are the only ones, and we were talking about that earlier, the that's the only writing, the only written um, text uh, on this entire planet today, across all of the nations. It's the only thing that is pure and perfect and from heaven. God's word is, right, it's God-breathed, it's profitable for doctrine, which is true. And how important is truth today, right? So doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So we have a lot of information sources today, don't we? Coming from a lot of places, but they're only as good as their source. Their source. And you could say, well, I trust this source or that source, but can you really trust it? Absolutely. This is the only source that we know comes right from heaven, and God says, I've put it down here into these 66 books, and it's everything that uh, you need. So how valuable is it? Of course, more than silver and gold and fine gold and all the riches of the earth. This is more valuable, and we get the time to uh, share it together today. Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 1. Mark writes, and he says, getting up. <laughs> so he must have been sitting down. Getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Crowds gathered around him again, and according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. So Mark has concluded Jesus' ministry in the Galilee region. He will not return. Um, he will not be back there until the millennium uh, if he chooses to go and, and visit that area there. But um, that's it. He's making his way toward Jerusalem and toward his death. So that has been his home ministry grounds. Kind of, if you will, a, a, a test case or a, kind of a small you know, piece of the whole entire nation of Israel that um, um, would be able to see him, walk with him, um, you know, learn from him, and everything that they've seen and everything that they've listened to has been perfect. They could not find any fault with him. Nobody could ever look at anything and say, that's not right, or that's not of God, or that's not true. And so uh, to them, then uh, now Jesus has kind of been talking about, well, what's your response? Who do you say that I am? And uh, of course, they've, many have come to the wrong conclusions not because they couldn't, not because they didn't see, not because it wasn't there in front of them, but is because they would not receive him, is what the Bible says. And uh, there's a lot of reasons why men don't want to receive God and turn to God. Uh, God knows those things, but Jesus knows as well. And he says, my time is done. So now he's heading down uh, really toward Jerusalem. But in that path, um, the Bible says here that he went to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. So where is that? Well, that's where John the Baptist, uh, um, um, he spent most of his time in his ministry. It's there on the Jordan, but it's really what we call today Transjordan. So it would be the other side of the Jordan River, the east side of the Jordan River. And, um, and so now today that's modern day Jordan. And then... Uh, Jesus chose to go out that direction and travel uh, for probably several reasons, but the main one was that he could 
avoid as much as possible uh, the Pharisees and uh, the Sadducees and the leaders and all of it because they're plotting his, his death. And Jesus is going to be right on time when he comes into Jerusalem, right in the time that God has sent him for. Uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, he was born, um, you know, um, uh, in perfect time, in the timing of the Lord. And Jesus has been talking about, my time has not yet come, but now his time has come. So he's making that journey, uh, avoiding uh, the leaders of, of Israel because they're not going to take his life before he gives it. And so he's going to surrender his life. And we'll see a little bit more uh, of that. So um, everybody, he's asked, you know, who, who are they saying that I am? And of course, they've come to the wrong conclusion. Some said Elijah, some said John the Baptist. And, uh, but there were others that said he's a false prophet. And, uh, or even they called him Satan. But uh, the idea was that he was a deceiver and he wasn't who he said he was. But they came to some conclusion, didn't they? But the 12 had, uh, excluding Judas, had come to the determination that he was the Messiah. And he, they're getting some revelations that he's the son of God, but um, everything isn't computing in uh, their head. So um, Jesus wants them to embrace what's coming, that is his death and his resurrection. And uh, he wants them to uh, understand that what's coming for them is persecution. Everything they're going to watch him go through is what the world's going to foist on them for standing for him. And he wants them to be willing to take up their cross and follow him. He wants them to know that the secret of life is going to be to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. That's the key to life. And they're going to learn some more lessons in this section as well. And so he's on the eastern side there. The other side of there would be the West Bank, is what we call the western side. And so there's a little bit of a barrier there. It doesn't mean the Pharisees couldn't cross over that barrier, but for the most part, um, it was a one more chance to have the multitudes come up to him and as we'll see, he talks with them and he teaches them. And uh, he, again, does what he had done up in the Galilee region. Um, but after a while, he had to scale all that back, right? Remember, he started talking in parables and all of that. And then he was <clears throat> only going to talk to those who would hear, uh, who wanted to hear and wanted to listen. But now he kind of throws all of that off and he begins to speak because these are the people that are in Judea. Um, uh, in the Transjordan area. So that's why he's there. So he's teaching. Verse 2. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him. So, so much for avoiding all of the Pharisees. Um, it wasn't a long journey from up in Jerusalem to come down there to where Jericho is, down by the kind of what we see the Dead Sea now, and uh, to come in that region. There might have even been Pharisees that were living in that area, but they came across, and uh, the key words are testing him. Testing him. Um, they didn't come to hear Jesus um, teach, but they came to test Jesus, or in some ways you could say to tempt him. Satan tests us for us to try to make us fail. God tests us, two different words in there, but his testing is to reveal to us what is there. So God is for us, but these guys, of course, were with Satan and they were against him. They were trying to find a reason that they could tag on for killing him. Interesting that they would want to kill him. So we've talked about that, but get that through your mind. What, what about Jesus makes you want to kill him? You know, what, what demonstration, what word, what, uh, you know, gift of healing or, you know, um, miracles uh, that he has done that you would say, well, I'd really like to kill that guy. Um, but that's what's in their hearts. It's been revealed. And so, verse 3, and so they came to him and uh, they began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. So, 
They're trying to find something in the law that Jesus is violating. And when they hear him, of course, they, um, uh, they have interpreted the law differently than Jesus has. And man has a way of manipulating his own truth, right? So we see that truth, but it doesn't quite fit me well, so I'm going to keep working on it until my interpretation kind of fits what I want to do and how I want to live. And that's really the basis for uh, these uh, questions here. They had their laws, but then they also had their traditions. And uh, that was what they added to the law. And they're going to judge Jesus by that. And so Jesus has already taught on the grounds of, uh, of, for divorce. He's already made that clear and earlier and uh, the Sermon on the Mount as well, that uh, God hates divorce and that uh, the only grounds for divorce um, should be adultery. He's going to explain why that is. But it seemed to, to violate the law, uh, the laws of Moses. And so um, that's why they're going to ask this question here. And so in verse 3, Jesus knew what they were going to ask. And uh, he answered them. He said, then what did Moses command you? I know you're thinking of Moses' command, so what did, what did he command you? And they said, Moses permits a man to write a certificate of divorce and then send her away. And that's kind of really what they wanted to do, have reason to be able to send uh, their wives away if they don't like uh, them or want another one. And so um, Jesus is you know, uh, referring to this verse here in Deuteronomy chapter 24. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found, okay, he's maybe searching, looking for the same thing they're doing with Jesus, a fault, right? Some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and uh, sends her out from his house, and he goes on to explain Basically, Moses said, okay, I'm going to allow you to do that. But the purpose of it, as you read on, was that um, if he's going to do that and you're going to write her a certificate of divorce, then she's gone and she's no longer yours, right? You are no longer bound together. And so she's free to go and to marry again. And, uh, and so um, this was a protection for um, the the woman in this culture, because she didn't, they didn't have a lot of rights. And so Moses was writing that because he knew what of the hardness of the heart of these guys and how they would try to do whatever they could to you know, get another wife and, and another wife and however they want to do that. But not also, not, not, um, also though, this, this um, protected uh, the woman. So he goes on to say, and, and if she again gets uh, remarries, you know, you can't have anything to do with her anymore. You've already put her away. So even if her husband dies and she becomes a widow again, she's not yours to take back again. And that's an abomination before God. So all of those were for protections there uh, for the woman. And uh, the Pharisees had interpreted this, you know, idea here of um, indecency, and it really had to do with the idea of it was that she has been unfaithful uh, to you. And that's the grounds that Jesus has given. Jesus said, this, these are the grounds. Adultery. You're in this union together. She's broken the vow of that union, and she's taken that away. Yes, you have the right then to break that union legally, and uh, she can go her way, and then you're free to remarry. You're, God doesn't make us, you know, uh, stay with somebody um, um, if they do not want to be faithful to us and, they, and they're with somebody else. And so it breaks the very core, as we'll see, of what God has designed. Doesn't mean you have to do that. Just means, you know, that was given. But they, but they souped it up a little bit. So they, this could be, you know, for some of the... Um, um, scribes and all of that of the interpretation of the rabbis, they would say, well, if you don't find your wife attractive anymore, um, then that's, that's a reason that you can get rid of her. And uh, maybe she's a poor housekeeper. Those are grounds. 
Maybe she uh, burned the toast. A poor cook. And so they've in, in, you know, brought all these things in. But what are they doing with it? The idea is they've broken the covenant of this for their own good and to the violation of the other that they've made the vow to. And uh, their idea was to um, abuse this law. And so Jesus is revealing it. He knows um, that they have the same hard hearts as um, um, Deuteronomy speaks of. They're the same guys, and their hearts were hard as well. So verse 5, but Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this command. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus goes past the law of Moses, and he goes all the way back. And he said, guys, we need to go back to the beginning. Because unless you understand what marriage is designed to be, um, and you have that down, uh, then we can talk about the reasons for divorce. But if you don't understand the foundation, and you're not on, on board with God regarding the foundation of the institution of marriage, then uh, there's no way you're going to handle uh, these things that can come up in life uh, regarding divorce. So long before Moses gave Israel the option for the certificate of divorce, uh, um, um, which, again, Moses only gave them because of the hardness of their hearts, of putting away their wives, um, that God had established something different. And uh, what a beautiful section of Scripture that is, because it just reminds us of the design of marriage. I just went to a wedding this weekend. Um, unfortunately, it, there really wasn't a big, um, any discussion on God's idea of marriage within the ceremony. So it kind of empties out this idea of what you're doing or why you're even getting married if there's not a reason or a purpose for it, or you don't have a, a design and a plan for it. But it isn't complicated. Uh, he just makes it very simple. It was God's design from the very beginning when He made us, that He made us male and He made us female. We're made in the image of God. We're equally in the image of God. But He made man with the capability, this is amazing, that the male and the female could come together and join together and become one. And that's what marriage is. It's, it's the male and the female coming together and forming something that is a unity. Now, this same scripture Paul uses as he describes um, um, a mystery. A mystery how two can become one. And of course, the, at the height of his explanation of that was that this mystery is that God would want to become one with us. And Jesus is the groom and we are his bride. And this does, he's designed us for that, hasn't he? In the same way that we could become one man and God could have a oneness together. And Jesus represents that. And that blew Paul's mind away um, you know, beyond this. But that's what marriage is supposed to be. And we all know that um, as we look at that, it is beautiful and it is wonderful. And it is the perfect design, isn't it? It's God's institution. Um, he has the final say then, shouldn't he, over what marriage is. Man wants to interject, really wants to give his two cents there, but I, don't, I think marriage should be, right? This kind of ends the debate because when he goes back and says, but no, no, here's what God says. And this is from the beginning. It's why we're here. And it's uh, his very uh, beginning. So when I go to a wedding and I do a wedding, I always like to establish that, that this, what we're doing here today is God's plan. It's God's design. Um, he's the one who formed it and he's the one who made it. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's perfect. Um, but it is divine. It's an institution formed by God. And uh, all of us can at least in our mind, even though we might have had ups and downs with the institution of marriage, we, um, <laughs> uh, 
know in our own heart that it could have been beautiful, it could have been wonderful, especially if both were wholeheartedly involved in that and willing to love and serve one another. We all get the picture of that. And, uh, and we know that that's um, a beautiful uh, union. So that's how God has made it. Now he's getting back to the point of marriage with these guys. The point of their interpretation of the law wasn't to grab a hold of the beauty of what God has designed. It, is to, it was to break the, this beautiful design. What are all of the ways that we can break this covenant? <laughs> How many ways can we do this? So your heart is wrong in that um, because it's uh, not with the Lord in it. So very simply, everybody knows this in here. This was the only union, only between a male and a female, in marriage, was the only conduit, the only uh, place where sexuality was to be expressed. So everything outside of that is sin. And um, I think we know by living in the world that we live in, the consequences of breaking that. It always breaks, doesn't it? And uh, Paul described it as joining together and then tearing apart, being broken apart. And uh, so God loves us. He wants the very best for us. And that's why he sets those uh, you know, uh, loving, logical limits for us. It's good for us to understand that, even though uh, maybe we have broken those things, but, but it's just another testament of all the things that come with. And if you think about it, a world where... Those things have been violated. Um, everything outside of it brings untold misery and destruction upon society, humanity, families, and individuals. I mean, the pain is just uh, immeasurable in that. And, um, and so I don't think we need to debate that. So sex outside of marriage uh, damaged this institution, this plan of God, and... Um, um, in some form, whether adultery or fornication uh, is there. So, um, this is why adultery um, is the only reason given that would qualify for termination of a marriage is in, God, in Jesus' statements. It's the only reason that God would say, okay, that is a right that you need to have, be able to have and to hold that, that this thing could be terminated and um, because that is the formal breaking of that, uh, of that union. doesn't mean you couldn't put it back together. doesn't mean God couldn't heal it. But God says, I'll allow you that. Um, but of course, they'd have allowed a, a lot more. Now, Paul goes on to give us another reason. So later on, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. He says, yet if the unbeliever... A uh, believing one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So Paul adds another one, and he's kind of careful to do that. He's saying, listen, this, this was not Jesus' teaching. This is my teaching. But he was saying it, my teaching, under the, Holy, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that <clears throat> along the same lines with, Marriage being like a relationship with the Lord, right? Between man and, and the Lord. If the person that you're living with refuses to be with you for the purpose of saying is, I don't want to be linked together with a believer, the one who follows Jesus. Now, he goes on, to, I mean, he says also, he says, but, but if they're okay with that, then you, you're bound together. Yeah, you got married, <coughs> excuse me, one gets saved and turns their life to the Lord. Their life changes dramatically. And now the other one's saying, hey, you're not the person that I married. And, uh, and so uh, now it's like, I, I don't want to be with this person. I don't want to be with the Lord. And that bothers me every time I look at you or whatever it is. And if they refuse that, then Paul is just saying, listen, that's, that's, that's the same thing. There's no way to put that uh, back together there. Um, um, obviously, if they are willing, then yes, you are bound uh, to this, and you can love them as unto the Lord, and that's a beautiful testimony, powerful, 
as well to maybe lead them to the Lord. And there's a lot of blessings from it. So a couple of things that are given here. Now, um, God's, God's design of marriage is beautiful and wonderful and perfect. And we can just know that. But what's the problem? Us. We're the problem with that. As perfect and beautiful and wonderful as that is, is the problem is that when a man and a woman come together, they're sinful and they're fallen. And there's a lot of trouble that lays in that. And I'm not going to go through all of the you know, possible things that can go wrong, but when imperfect, sinful people uh, enter into this perfect union, it's no longer perfect, is it, in every way, and uh, we mess it up, and we mess up God's perfection. So we're the testimony, uh, a lot of us, into how we can mess that up, or in the other side of marriage is that it takes two to be uni- united together, and if one does not want to be united, then uh, that is trouble. Um, and so what's the answer to the problem? How do we make marriage successful? And I think we're living in a time where marriage needs to be lifted up. The design of God, the purpose of, you know, of union and family and all of it lays at this foundation that's called marriage. But what's the answer if, you know, how are any marriage is going to survive if they're, if they're, uh, Fallen people, lost people, sinful, selfish people at heart. Uh, well, the answer is we need God's grace. Grace. And His mercy. In every way surrounding the problem of marriage, we need the grace of God. That's the only one who can help us uh, as we mess things up. And uh, so we need that uh, grace and mercy, but how do we get that grace and mercy? Well, the Bible says there's an answer for that too. It's called repentance. It's, it's of turning away uh, ourselves away from our, our sin there and repenting of our sin and giving ourselves over to the Lord. That's the answer, right? It doesn't solve every problem, um, but that's uh, the direction we need to go. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot more opportunity for God to keep a union together when uh, both people are willing to turn to God. And he used to say in marriage counseling, I'm, I'm pretty sure no matter what your problem is, it can be solved. I mean, I'm absolutely sure there's a solution to that problem. But the question is, are you willing to do what it takes to solve that problem? And, uh, and I said, number one is, you're going to have to surrender to God and say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do in this situation. And that's a hard thing, isn't it? And invariably, there'll be one who's willing to do it, and the other one says, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I just, I just want what I want. I'm not going to do it. And so, again, that's uh, the problem. Let me give you an example of messing things up. It's a really good example. Uh, it's a message of um, um, an example of, of a king, uh, King David. So we know in the backdrop of King David's life that God loved him. And he said, he's, he's a man after my own heart. And uh, yet we read that he committed adultery, lusted after a woman, desired her, was not his wife, took another man's wife, committed adultery with her, and thought he was going to get away with it, and then she became pregnant. So, tried to fix this problem, um, but it, God wouldn't let him fix the problem. And, and so since uh, the husband who was serving him under him would not go back with his wife so they could cover up their, uh, his sin, uh, David said, well, the only thing I can do now is kill him. So he murders the guy. And uh, this is uh, uh, David. This is King David. And we remember him for this, don't we? And uh, so he married her basically still in sin because he wasn't repentant over what he did and he hadn't confessed his sin uh, before the Lord. Yet, here's the amazing part. When David did repent, God forgave him. That blows me away. That's grace. That's mercy. We need that from God. And you know what's amazing to me too when you read in the Bible, um, David... 
knew that God would forgive him. He knew the kind of God that he served, and he, he humbled himself, and he bowed before the Lord, and he repented. And if you want to see what repentance looks like, read Psalm 51. It's a great chapter. The whole chapter is good. But let me just give you a brief glimpse of it. He said, be gracious. Be gracious to me, O God. According to your love, your loving kindness, man isn't willing to do this for me. I'm probably not even willing to do this for myself. But God, will you be gracious with me? According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Create in me, verse 10, he goes on to say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David writes and he exclaims that he knows that the Lord is willing to do that. That's the kind of God that he serves. So isn't that good news? Don't we all need a little grace, right? A little mercy as we've messed those things up. And uh, so Jesus is not tightening the screws and saying everybody that's broken this in any way is you know, not fit for the kingdom and hell. No, no. Because he even took the woman that was caught in adultery, right? And uh, they were trying to trick, uh, trap Jesus in this and saying she was caught in the very act of adultery. And, and uh, Jesus took the gracious route, didn't he? And he began to write down all the sins of these men that were surrounding her and all of her accusers. One by one, they started peeling off. Imagine the Lord knew a few things about their lives as well. And of course, one of them couldn't even, could have even been the man who was sleeping with her. Uh, because obviously, there was a guy there too in the middle of that. They didn't bring him. But the point is, at the end, he said, well, who is there to accuse you? And he said, so therefore, I'm, I will not accuse you either. I'm not going to, uh, you you're, you're deserve death, um, but there's going to be grace and mercy to you. Go and sin no more. So it wasn't as if the Lord said, hey, I'm okay with this. Uh, no, go and sin no more. And uh, praise the Lord for that. It's beautiful to know that, uh, you know, this is the way. Now, for divorce in general, as you talk about this subject, we all know this, that what comes with divorce, if it does take place, and there's a reason why God says he hates it because there's a lot of consequences that come with it. David didn't avoid the consequences. God forgave him. He was still, he, he would continue to be a man after God's own heart, a man who would repent and turn, and he really did, but it still cost him. So that child, the Lord took that child, so he lost that child there. Maybe the Lord was sparing that child from what was ahead of him, being born into the middle of that. But by the grace of God, God allowed Bathsheba to have another son. And uh, her next son was a man named Solomon. And God uh, chose him, selected him to be the next king of Israel from David's sons, right? And, uh, and God was willing to give him every chance to be obedient uh, to him. That's the grace of God. So he does hate divorce, um, um, there, but David was uh, bore the consequences of that. A lot of problems in his life, a lot of problems in his family, and so we can't avoid all of the consequences of that. But we can walk under the grace of the Lord, and to know that we've been forgiven. And I'm amazed that David that he could hold his head up in the middle of that, and uh, and he went on and he went on to serve the Lord and obey the Lord and all the things there that God uh, commanded of him, no matter what everybody else uh, thought of him. And uh, so praise the Lord for his grace and his mercy. Verse 10, in the house of the disciples, in the house, the disciples began questioning him about uh, this again. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Okay, so he's redefining what adultery is, isn't he? Now he's saying, okay, well, well let me give you another form of adultery Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. Now, this is assuming that he's divorcing her without the cause of true adultery, because that is already accepted. So he's just decided to divorce her anyway. And he says, all right, well, that's a sin against the Lord, as adultery is. And if 
she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. So God's not giving a pass for this that everybody should do. He's, he's giving a narrow thing here of saying, we need to do everything in our ability to keep that marriage together. At any cost, you know, work there together so that you can solve those things and work that out. It's better, especially with forgiveness and grace toward one another as well. So, um, but he's uh, um, saying this, uh, uh, divorce without adultery is to commit adultery in that sense. It's not right before, before God. Is that an unforgivable sin that can never be forgiven? No, the Bible doesn't say that. But it just says that that, that is sinful. And, and that's kind of what the problem with these guys was. He was pinpointing it that, you know, you putting away your wife for things without, besides adultery, you're the adulterer. So I imagine they didn't really like that uh, idea of it. But that's the heart of the law, right? What God gives is because he wants the very best, but they didn't want the very best. Um, they wanted to skirt that because their hearts were hard and he was revealing this um, uh, to them. So like David said, I didn't, I didn't sin, just sin against Bathsheba and, and you know, uh, sin against her, her husband and I sinned against you, God. And uh, that's what he's getting at here. Verse 13, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and he said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. There's only one way into the kingdom, and you have to come like a child. What does that mean? Right? It says he took them in his arms and he began blessing them, laying his hands on them. What's so special about the way these children were coming to him? Because they had childlike faith, didn't they? There was nothing on the agenda. They weren't trying to, you know, to avoid something or get something there. They were just honest and open and transparent. They were looking at Jesus, uh, they loved him, and they wanted to come to him, and he says, don't, don't stop them. That's the way I want everybody to come to me, right? Just with the love in their heart of saying, God, would you save me? Would you, you know, uh, by your grace there, there's no agenda to it. And uh, Jesus said, listen, if you want to be saved, that's the way you're to come as well. And uh, God will never turn away that um, anybody who just honestly comes to the Lord and said, you know, God, would you, would you take me? Would you forgive me? Would you save me? Uh, he won't turn uh, uh, anyone like that away. A lot of people were coming to Jesus for a lot of reasons, um, but he was pointing back to childlike faith, and uh, that is what the kingdom uh, is about. Of course, it was wonderful to have a little kid there. Kids are pretty honest, right? Uh, they're just, they are what they are, and they don't really care who they're talking to either. Um, they'll point out the you know, big hair that's growing out of your ears or, you know, whatever, whatever you got going on. They're like, yeah, you, you don't have any hair, you know. Um, it's nothing personal. They're just saying it as it is. And uh, it's probably refreshing to be in that kind of honest, you know, simple conversation. And uh, the Lord loves it. And that's the way he wants us to come to him is to verse, verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey... A man ran up to him, and this is going to deal with the same thing of how you approach the Lord and what your agenda is. It says, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, a good teacher, he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. That's why they call it the rich young ruler. You say, well, how do you know he's rich and young and a ruler? Well, you really don't from just reading this verse. But you read each one, um, um, Luke says that he was a ruler who came. So he was a prominent man of power who came. Matthew calls him young, that he was a young man that came. And then all th three of the accounts all state very clearly that he was a very wealthy man. So he was rich and he was young and he was a ruler. Now, it's great to be rich, but it isn't so great to be rich when you're old. 
right? And you can't enjoy those riches as well. This guy had it all. He had the riches, but he still had his youth, right? And then with that, he had gotten what a lot of people want, which is the power uh, to do that. And so he, he was in a pretty uh, uh, place where uh, most everybody, you know, in the natural sense wants to be. If I just had this money, I just had this ability and all of that, uh, he had it all. So um, he says to him, you know, basically he's saying to him, he knelt before him, he said, good teacher. Now that was, that was one little tell there. Uh, Jesus is going to call him on it. Uh, what does that mean? When you call me good. What, who do you think I am? Who, who, are you, who are you saying I am? What do you believe about me? And then the second one was, what must I do? What must I do? So, a lot of problems with that, because I think that's the natural sense that we have, is that it's going to be us to do, up to, us to do something in order to be saved. I'm going to have to reach some kind of level. I'm going to have to do enough things, and doing is the way to be saved. And of course, it's not. We can't do. We can't earn. There's no way that I could do enough to forgive my sins. I can do all the good things in the world, um, but all of them together wouldn't, wouldn't pay for one of my sins. So I'm at the mercy of God. And uh, but yet his mindset was, what can I do? It's just the way it is. I, whatever I need to do, I'm going to do it. And uh, so Jesus is going to go along with the game, right? Okay, let's see what you're willing to do. And uh, so he's going to bring him to the law. And uh, um, he's, not, he's not wanting mercy. He's not wanting grace. He's just saying, hey, what, what can I do here to enter, to earn my way into your, your kingdom? And Jesus said to him, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. What do you think you're talking to here? How good do you think I am? <laughs> am I just a pretty good guy? Or am I so good? And so perfect that I would be God. And he's wanting to jog his mind here because he's, he's not fully focused on, on who he was. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not be a fraud, right? Uh, honor your father and mother. And these are all the commands uh, that we see in, in the second half. It's, it's commands five, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. But Jesus avoids the first part of it because that's where he's going to get him in there. But he says all of these things didn't seem to phase the guy uh, at all. And he's saying, well, can you do all of them? Have you done all of them? Of course, he'd have to do them perfectly. All of those perfect in every way, all of his life without fail. So um, there's a problem with him if he's going to say that he, he really has done all of that because Nobody has been able to keep all of those commandments all of your life. But he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all, all these things from my youth. And looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him, compassion for him. Kind of knew where he was really at. It wasn't, the guy was still looking. There was some searching that was going on. It was, it was honest. And he was misguided, but it wasn't trying to trick Jesus or anything. Um, he was just stating this from his own perspective. I've done all of this. And he says, one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. I love this picture here. God always gets at the heart of really where, you know, what the Bible says, where your treasure goes right, that's where your heart is. And uh, so we're going to find out where, where is your heart in all of this. And um, so... If you have kept all those commands, then that's great. Just sell everything that you have. But he said, at these words, he was sad. Okay? So why, why are you sad? Didn't you just ask me to give you everlasting life, eternal life, to never die, to be in the presence of God forever? What's that worth to you? Okay? But he was sad. Why was he sad? Because he didn't believe that Jesus could give it to him. You know, if I knew that I was going up and I was going to ask a guy, let's say I was going to ask a guy, you know, for, 
all of the riches and in, in you know prosperity and as prosperity and ease you know uh, uh, for all the days of my life. And and I knew the guy had the ability easily to give that to me. It doesn't matter what price he put on that; I would pay it. Because if that guy could give that to me, there's nothing that I wouldn't give away. So he was sad because he didn't believe it. He went away grieving for he was, he was one who owned much property. But Jesus got to, a, I think, the bigger issue that was going on. It's what he really wants from all of us. Um, and, and that is in this scripture here in Matthew, he reveals it. He says, uh, another guy came up to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. There's one thing I did with my life or one thing I could do that was greater above everything else I could do. What would that one thing be? And Jesus didn't hesitate. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the great and foremost commandment. So this guy loved his riches more than he loved Jesus, didn't he? And uh, there wasn't even a comparison. Immediately he was sad. And there wasn't even a thought of it. You know, he wasn't even debating it. It was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm out, right? He began to walk away. But it just amazes me because he didn't know who he was talking to. He was talking to the guy who owned everything. I mean, not just everything we see, but everything we can't see. I mean, the entire universe, it's all his. So he was wealthy beyond, you know, what this man could ever be in a million lifetimes if um, and but he didn't see him that way, did he? And he 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 didn't have his priority to say, you know what? Um, he didn't see Jesus as God because if he did, then that commandment would stick out to him that you love me more than anything that this world has, and you will have, as Jesus says, everything. Now, is that still true in our life? Is our life the same? Is there anything that this world can provide you a treasure? that is greater than the treasure of knowing Jesus and being saved and having eternal life? What's coming our way because we walk with Jesus? I mean, it's a byproduct of turning our hearts to God and Him forgiving us, you know, which is worth everything. But not only on top of that, aren't we going to be joint heirs with Jesus? Is that what the Bible says? What does that mean? It means we got an inheritance coming. Now, some of us might have been disappointed in what our parents left, uh, you know, to us in an inheritance. And, um, but we got a pretty good inheritance coming. We're going to be joint heirs with Jesus. Well, what does Jesus own? He owns everything. So what's Jesus willing to give us? All that he has. You can have all of it. You can be joint heirs with me. And uh, we get to be a part of that. Now, if we really believe that, is there anything on, in this world that's really going to make the difference for us? Is there really anything we could say, well, if I just had that, that, that would make it. That's, that's what life is about. And then we know the other side of it too. Or do any of those things ever satisfy us? You know, uh, I know Donald Trump has said this uh, before, but he said the excitement, the the, the joy and all, uh, you know, the greatest joy and all of it that I get out of life uh, for me is the pursuit of the goal. It's the pursuing it. But once you get it, it's just, just empty. And, uh, but it's the idea of trying to reach these goals. That's, that's the, uh, the joy of it. But when you actually get it, uh, the things of this world, it's empty, isn't it? And um, so this guy... You know, loved his riches uh, a lot more than God. And, um, of course, all these guys are looking at it, and they're, they're saying, wow, okay, well, that's a pretty steep price to pay. You have to give everything that you have and give it to the poor and to follow Jesus. And then a couple of those guys are standing there, the disciples are thinking, well, that's kind of what we did, right? We left all, and we've been following the Lord. And so Jesus, looking around, he said to his disciples, verse 23, how hard Hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and he said to them, Children, how hard, how hard is it to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And it sounds like it's really hard. 
to get into the kingdom. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying it's really hard for man to get himself into the kingdom. I mean, it's really hard. In fact, it's, it's really just impossible to do because man can't do it. He can't get himself into the kingdom of God. And that's what this, this rich young ruler wanted to do. He's going to do something to get himself in. He says, they were even more astonished and, and said to him, then, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible. But with God, he says, not with God, for all things are possible with God. How hard is it for God to get us into the kingdom? <laughs> it's not impossible for him, right? Because he's able to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteous, and then we can enter in. So it was hard, just as it was hard for this man to do this on his own. It's impossible to do it, but it's not hard uh, for God. Uh, very simple. Faith in Jesus changes everything. It changes the way we value life. It changes the way we what we think is important in life. It changes our goals in life. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not feeling really satisfied with this world. It's just not. It's not cutting it. I can't really think of anything that I could possess in this world that would make a difference uh, for me or fully satisfy my life, especially not now knowing Jesus. I'm just longing to be with Him. Amen? And that's kind of the thing that we long for more than anything and that's just the truth of Scripture. It says this, is, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's a reason why you love this world and you calculate everything by what you have in this world or how you're accepted by this world. Um, it's because you don't, you don't love him. But when you love him, that changes, right? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. We get, if we follow those things of our lives, our eyes, our flesh, our pride, uh, we'll never be satisfied and the world will suck the life out of us. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. There we go. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms. Because the Bible says when you're called to the Lord, um, sometimes you have to leave all of those things. Uh, family turns against you. Siblings turn against you. Uh, sometimes for following the Lord, you lose possessions and things that you have. He says, for my sake, if you do that for my sake or, and for the gospel's sake, but that, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions. And in the age to come, though, eternal life. Here's kind of the bottom line here. Um, there's no better life to live than a life lived for the Lord. It's the richest life you could ever live. And you can't quantify that. And a part of the riches, I think, are important. And these brothers and sisters are not your biological brothers and sisters, but they're other believers that love the Lord. Our fellowship together as one another, we're like family. And that's an inheritance for us. Some of us were just talking about that. Some of our loved ones have already gone uh, ahead. And we can't wait to see them. That's, that's, an in, that's something to look forward to, right? It's a relationship that was there. And now it's going to be restored. And uh, it's part of the riches that we have uh, in the Lord. There's no comparison uh, there to it. Uh, yes, it might cost you a lot here. But in the end, when you calculate it up, hundreds of times better than anything the world uh, could ever give you. Even the sufferings and the persecution are going to do great things uh, in your life if you do them as unto the Lord. Verse 35, James and John, this is interesting, uh, the two sons of Zebedee um, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Wow, wow. That's an interesting start to a conversation. Hey, will you just promise that whatever I ask you, you'll, you'll do it? And, uh, and, uh, and he said to them, well, um, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. To them in their mind, it was his coming bodily kingdom. And when this all goes down, 
and you become king, can one of us be at your right hand and one of us at your left? In other words, could we have the first seat and the second seat of power in your kingdom? That's, that's pretty amazing. But it gets worse, because if you read it in, in the, um, I think it was Matthew uh, that ex- exclaims it. He says, no, it wasn't just James and John who came to Jesus. It was James and John's mother who brought them up to Jesus. And she's the one who said, I want my boys to have the number one and number two seat in your kingdom. So your mama is leading you to, these are the sons of thunder, by the way. And uh, now they're uh, going with mom to beg for a seat here. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? I skipped the whole section here, didn't I? I'll just go back and read it because it has to do with this story. Because it's almost as if they skipped the same story as well. But they're on the road uh, up to Jerusalem, verse 32, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the 12 aside, and he began to tell them, and he had just explained to them this. Here's Here's what's next. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hang him over, hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, uh, he will rise again. So just moments after that, they come in and say, we'd like to have a part of that. Can we sit it? They weren't thinking that. It all just washed over him. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. You don't understand what my cup is, right? Um, he says in verse 38, or do you not know what you are asking? You are, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We're, we are able. We could do it. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you, you shall drink. You're going to get a taste from this cup. Uh, you're going to suffer great things. And uh, you should be baptized with the baptism with which I am uh, going to be baptized. You're going to get submersed into this same um, uh, boiling cauldron here uh, in your life. You are going to taste this. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And so we understand that. They did not understand this. But um, what an amazing thing to ask for. I don't think it went over well, though. Verse 41, hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with Uh, James and John, it says, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. You know what leaders of power, how they wield their power, they stand over the top of you. This is what you want? You want that? But it's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now let me just ask you this. If there was one person who ever got to live on this world in a fallen state of humanity who could deserve to have power and authority and um, riches and treasures and goodness and accolades and all of these things that these guys are searching after. There was one person on the earth, whoever lived on the earth, who deserved that. Wouldn't it be Jesus? There's anybody who could have taken that power and authority and riches and all of it It was Jesus who could have done that. But what did he do with that? He gave it all away, didn't he? And he decided to serve everyone. So I'm going to take that, and I'm going to use that to be the servant of all. So he's not asking them to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. But he said, listen, this is my kingdom. You want to be great? Be the least. You want to be, you know, you want to take, you want to be high above people? Then get underneath them. 
And uh, it's a kingdom principle. It's a great principle. And it's a hard one for us to even think about because we don't like to serve people. Um, but God says, you want to be great? Be the servant of all. Then he came to, they came to Jericho, and he was leaving Jericho with his disciples. And a large crowd um, was there, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, imagine being blind. You're just listening. All you can do is hear. He began to cry out and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Doesn't even know if he can even hear him. Many were sternly telling him, be quiet. You're the lowest of the low. You're the beggar. You're the blind man. Don't, don't disturb him, right? Be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. It's quite a statement. He didn't, he'd never even seen Jesus. He just, he just heard of him. But what did he call him? He called him the son of David. What does that mean? It means you're the Savior. You're the Messiah. You're the one who will sit on the throne of Israel forever. You're the, you're the promised one. And yet he's a blind man. And Jesus stopped and he said to him, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's, he's calling you know, for you. In other words, I don't know why, but he is. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and he came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I, I want to regain my sight. And let me just tell you this. He was physically blind, but he, his eyes were wide open. I mean, that was, that was the least of things here. He, he had full vision already, um, but he wanted his sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately... He regained his sight and he began to follow him on the road. What did he want to do more than anything after he regained his sight? He got to see the one he already saw you know, by faith, and now he sees him. What did he want to do? He wanted to follow him. So he didn't have anything to give, right? but he had a, a heart to follow him. These men who had everything didn't have eyes to even see Jesus, didn't want to see him for who he was. And that's the picture that he gives here as he goes up to Jerusalem, because when he gets up there, he's going to meet a bunch of blind guys. He calls them blind guides. That's who you are. You're blind guides. You're leading other people into the ditch because you're blind. But the, but the Lord said, if, if anybody has ears to hear, let him hear. If anybody has eyes to see, let them see. And uh, the Lord uh, wants us to see. And let me close this in prayer tonight. Lord, we want to see Jesus, not with our physical eyes as much as we do with our spiritual eyes. We want to look on your son, see him for who he was in this life and who he is now at your right hand in glory. And uh, Father, we thank you that you spent everything when you owned everything uh, at the cost of everything beyond anything that could be measured you were willing to sacrifice that and give your own son in our place and uh, to serve us. And uh, all you ask in return for is for us to accept that and to believe on you and that you would give us eternal life and then an inheritance that will never fade. Uh, keep that, help us to keep that in our eyes, Lord, as we walk through this world. Um, help us to see your son and... Uh, and to, to do the greatest thing, which is to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, which you're so deserving of. We love you and we give you praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.